so the long-awaited part two of the destroyer development video series and today we're looking at the interwar destroyer development so we've already looked at the run-up to world war one from the time that destroyers were first developed up to the end of that conflict but world war one leaves destroyers in a very different place to where they'd been 20 years before but in the next 20 years which we're going to look at today that takes us from the end of one world war to the start of another and sees numerous developments which are going to leave the destroyer entering the next global conflict as a completely different ship again from the ships that were present in 1919. Now, happily for fans of other navies, we now are forced to expand our view out past the Royal Navy, with occasional contributions from others, since each major navy would now develop its own distinct destroyer design traditions, and some would even end up with multiple design lineages, so we have to consider each of them. So in this video, we're going to broadly look at the development of destroyers in each navy, with occasional comments given when developments in one navy or another crossed over to affect other navies. I'm going to start by saying that two navies that take part in World War II, the Russian and the German, are going to be initially ignored as because of reasons of internal revolution and treaty restrictions respectively, they contributed relatively little to the development of destroyers until the latter part of the interwar period, which is where we'll pick them up on later in the video. So, in 1919, the navies that could look forward to developing destroyer designs further in any great numbers were, of course, the British Royal Navy, the United States Navy, the Marine Nationale of France, the Regina Marina, or I don't even know how that's pronounced, of Italy, and the Imperial Japanese Navy. It's worth looking at where each navy was with destroyers at the start of the interwar period before we look at their individual lineages. So your average 1919 destroyer comes in at a standard displacement of between 1,000 and 1,200 tonnes, with the lower end of the bracket held by the Imperial Japanese Navy, whose current destroyers are still in the high hundreds of tonnes and will only break 1,000 tonnes at full load. The heavier end of things was occupied by the French, who'd been forced to build or buy a number of small destroyers during the war, but whose first venture into new destroyers as the war came to a close was the uh, Borasque class, I think, um, which was already pushing thir uh, 1,300 tonnes standard and hit nearly 2,000 tonnes fully loaded. This set a bit of a theme, which we'll cover later in French ships. The average speed of a destroyer was between 32 and 35 knots, and armament was generally four single 4-inch or 120mm guns, with an anti-aircraft gun or two thrown in there for morale purposes, and an average of about six torpedo tubes, although these varied being in some nations twin mounts and in other nations triple mounts. The Japanese and French navies used larger 4.7 and 5-inch guns respectively, although Japanese Navy ships carried fewer guns and torpedoes than average overall owing to their smaller size, whilst the larger French designs used the extra displacement simply to have heavier guns and a slightly larger than average anti-aircraft battery. Range was around 3,500 nautical miles, with notable exceptions being the Italian ships, which were designed for much shorter ranged Mediterranean operations, and the American ships, which had to deal with operating in the Pacific. Practically every destroyer had some ability to carry depth charges and or mines in varying numbers. Notable amongst all these, as 1919 drew around to 1920, as a standout design we have to look at the United States Navy's Clemson class. At just over 1200 tonnes standard and around 1300 tonnes fully loaded, it was on the heavier end of the average displacement band, but it was fast at just over 35 knots in a calm sea and had a very long range for a destroyer at just under 5,000 nautical miles. Four triple torpedo launchers and four single 4-inch guns also meant its armament was on the heavier end. There were a few disadvantages. Two of the guns were wing-mounted, which meant that they only had a three-gun broadside. This would leave them at a disadvantage in a gunnery duel with most destroyers, whose four single mounts were all on the centre line. But their unusually heavy torpedo armament was also made up of wing-mounted launches. Now, this did give an individual broadside of torpedoes that was no greater than average, but they were able to deliver 
a second torpedo broadside simply by turning around. However, with this said, the design was very capable of taking modification, with four of the ships being upgraded to 5-inch guns instead of the 4-inch weapons, and two of them even being fitted with twin 4-inch mounts in place of each single, for a total of eight guns and a well above average 6-gun broadside. Whilst perhaps not the most efficient layout of weapons, they're still a leading design for the period. The Washington Naval Treaty was primarily concerned with limitations on battleships and some regulation of cruisers, so whilst destroyers were discussed, the final treaty did not particularly affect their design. Amongst the larger navies, the Royal Navy and the United States Navy, there was something of a pause on destroyer construction in the early to mid-1920s, as the last of the wartime programs were wound down and the vast numbers of destroyers built during that period were rationalised with the best retained for the future fleet. In America in particular, the vast rafts of four-stacker flush-deck destroyers appeared as congressional funding predictably plummeted in the aftermath of the Washington Treaty, and the US Navy aimed to build first a modern cruiser fleet, thus addressing one of its biggest current weaknesses, and thus taking its eye off the destroyer ball for a while. The Italian, Japanese and French continued with incremental development of their various designs until 1926, when the Imperial Japanese Navy began work on the Fubuki class, which would set a whole new standard and cause a radical shift in destroyer design across the board. Various destroyers up to this point possessed relatively easily quantifiable strengths and weaknesses. Some were clearly superior gunboats, others were clearly better torpedo craft, some were faster, and others were slower, etc. etc. The Fubukis completely upended this paradigm, with a standard displacement about 500 tonnes greater than the previous average, their capabilities were without equal, at least on paper. Their main battery of six guns in three twin mounts were of a fairly heavy 127mm or 5-inch calibre, which gave them firepower superior to any gun-focused destroyer to date, and three triple torpedo launchers, each with a reload, also gave it a spread of heavy anti-shipping weapons greater than any torpedo-focused destroyer at the time. Comfortably capable of at least 35 knots, although again, as destroyers this would have been in a flat calm, they hadn't sacrificed speed for this equipment either. The main guns were also ostensibly dual-purpose, giving the ships an unprecedentedly heavy anti-aircraft battery as well. Of course, behind all the flashy statistics, there were issues. The dual-purpose mounting of the guns had a somewhat slow rate of fire for anti-aircraft work, and various improvements and changes were incorporated into the second and third groups of Fubukis that were constructed. Still, they were a huge improvement over the previous destroyer standard. More importantly, their appearance galvanised action in pretty much everyone else over the next few years. However, Responses were limited by a curtailment of destroyers in the London Naval Treaty a few years later to no more than 1,850 tonnes of standard displacement and 130mm or 5.1 inch calibre guns. In the Italian Navy, where destroyers had been on something of the small side, their response was influenced as much or more by developments of their rivals in France as it was by the appearance of the Fabukis. Nevertheless, their destroyer evolution is quite interesting. A number of small Esploratore Leggero, or scouting cruisers, had been built in addition to their small destroyers during and immediately after the First World War, and these would now gradually be reclassified as destroyers, as it was clear that their weaponry and size was now below the upper end of destroyer designs currently in service. The smaller, earlier destroyers would eventually be largely reclassified as torpedo boats due to their sub-1,000 ton displacement and use of lighter weight to torpedoes. The Cur Tatone class of the early 1920s had shown the start of a trend with the ship moving from single mounts to a pair of twin mounts, so still retaining four guns, but in fewer mounts. These would become a signature feature of Italian destroyers of the interwar period, albeit with gun size heading up from the 102mm or 4 inch guns of that particular class to 120mm or 4.7 inch guns in the following Lyonne class. 
which were themselves originally more esploratori, reclassified during construction to destroyers. The next few classes, the Sella, Sauro, and Turbine classes, all carried this main gun layout of two twin mounts, plus two sets of triple torpedo launchers. However, they would grow progressively larger and faster, with more and more anti-aircraft weapons added, since the Italians were especially conscious, above many other nations, that in their Mediterranean operations, the navy would almost certainly be in constant range of land-based aircraft. By the time of the Navigatori class in the late 1920s, the second Italian signature was in place, high speed. With the previous classes having raised speed in increments from 33 knots, these destroyers were now hitting 38 knots, although they were also the largest Italian destroyers of the interwar period at just over 1900 tonnes standard load this being just before the London Naval Treaty. It should also be noted at this point that due to their large size, these destroyers would be the only Italian interwar destroyers to be armed with six guns with an additional twin mount amidships. And subsequent classes would drop back down to the lower end of a four-figure displacement before inevitably gradually creeping back up. The standard of main battery, torpedo battery and speed that was set by the Navigatori's would remain essentially unchanged for the rest of Italian destroyer construction up to the start of the Second World War. Just across a rather narrow part of the Mediterranean Sea, French destroyer design, as mentioned earlier, was already taking a route towards the large and powerful before the Fabuki showed up, with two lines of development identified, the smaller Torpilia d'Escadra, was designed primarily to attack enemy ships with torpedoes and get into melee with similar enemy attack craft, while the larger variant, the Contre Torpilleur, was, as the name suggests, supposed to provide primary scouting capacity and defend the fleet from any remaining incoming attackers. In many ways, this may sound somewhat familiar, as it's a very similar division of roles to that in the late 19th century that had developed during the era of torpedo boats and torpedo gunboats before the advent of the all-in-one destroyer. The Borasca was an example of the former, despite being slightly larger than the average full-fleet destroyer of the time, but only the follow-on La Duat cl class followed down this particular line of development in the latter half of the 1920s. It would not be until almost the start of the Second World War that a third class of this type would be built. Instead, most development of French destroyers immediately before and after the Fabukis focused on the much larger contre torpilleur type, since the French saw that they couldn't build as many destroyers as potential rival powers, with the possible exception of the Italians, and so they instead focused on getting as much out of each individual ship as possible. At least, that was the theory. The first effort in this regard post-war had been the Chacal class at just over 2,100 tonnes standard and just under 3,000 tonnes fully loaded. They were considerably larger than any other destroyer afloat, including the soon-to-come Fabukis. Indeed, fully loaded, their displacement was closer to that of some small light cruisers of the time than it was to the average fleet destroyer. Nonetheless, it was the Fabuki that pointed the way forward, as comparatively speaking, the French ships had one less gun, carrying five 130mm guns in single mounts, two-thirds the torpedo launchers and no onboard reloads, 60% of the range, and approximately equal speed despite the extra 300 tonnes or so of standard displacement. Nevertheless, the French pressed on with this concept, with the next class of contre torpilleurs built after the Fabukis began to appear, retaining the two triple torpedo launchers, but added another 300 tonnes to displacement, with a larger hull, which supported the same five single gun layout, only now at 5.5 inch calibre, along with a slight increase in speed. Anti-aircraft armament was changed from a couple of 3 inch guns to four smaller 37mm weapons. The Aiglers then brought back one of the 3-inch anti-aircraft guns and another half knot in speed for 36 knots in exchange for another 100 tonnes of displacement. The follow-on Vauklin class were effectively repeats, simply adding a single extra torpedo launching tube. This tranche of development would end with the Le Fantesque class, which added just over another 100 tonnes of displacement 
for about 2,500 tonnes displacement standard and up to 3,400 tonnes fully loaded. And this was on a late 1920s, early 1930s destroyer. This brought generally the same gun battery as previous ships, but upgraded the torpedo array to nine tubes via three triple launchers and a truly absurd design speed of 45 knots, although 40 knots was more practical as a top operational speed. The Italians actually ended up having to bring back the Esploratori concept and ended up ordering a bunch of full-on small light -like cruiser classes as counters and their displacement was barely more than the almost unpronounceable French destroyers. This line of destroyer development was not without its problems. The London Naval Treaty now appeared to cut the idea off at the knees with its displacement limit, the large guns proved somewhat slow to fire and unwieldy to man generally, and especially hard to manage at speed, problems with the supply hoists for the shells didn't help, and time and again in this period various navies would discover that the weight involved in any shell above 5 inches was generally just a bit too much to expect a crew to rapidly and consistently handle in a prolonged engagement, leading to exhaustion and mistakes made in short order. The French ships also sacrificed structural elements to keep the hulls light enough to gain their high speed, which would lead to a ra number of rather interesting issues operationally, especially given the battering the hulls were subjected to when the ships were tearing around at full pelt. With the aforementioned treaty temporarily stopping construction of more of these absurdly large destroyers, French shipbuilding took a temporary diversion with a single class of what were really torpedo boats, the La Mel Pomen Pomene, which class which dropped back to under a thousand tonnes, with a relatively minimal gun battery and a mere six torpedo tubes. However, Article 24 of the London Naval Treaty meant the destroyer tonnage limits were initially only binding on the US, the UK and Japan, with these obligations being brought in for Italy and France on a later agreed date. The French, shortly thereafter, took a look at this situation and effectively went, well, yes, but actually no, and so after a few delays related to negotiations with Italy, they recommenced their large destroyer construction with the Mogador class in late 1934. These ships would add yet more displacement, coming in at just under 3,000 tonnes standard and 4,000 tonnes fully loaded, taking them directly into small light -like cruiser territory. This bought an over 50% increase in range, a 39 knot top speed, a main battery of 8 5.4 or 138mm guns in twin turrets, along with 10 torpedo tubes in a pair of triple and a pair of twin launchers. Although once again issues with the guns and the weight of the shells meant the rate of fire was considerably less than designed. They also suffered issues with cavitation on the propellers and a marked lack of agility. The Dunkirk-class battlecruisers that they were supposed to be escorting could in fact outturn them. On the plus side, they were much more strongly built, and despite some top weight issues with stability, were generally regarded as decent sea boats, and on trials, actually proved capable of exceeding their 39 knot nominal top speed. Four improved versions, generally known as the Kleber class, were under construction at the outbreak of the Second World War, which pulled down the curtain on French destroyer development for the period we're looking at. One final note on French destroyer development would come with one last class of Tourpillier d'Escadre, as mentioned earlier, at the end of the 1930s, the Le Hardy class. Designed with the rising numbers of powerful destroyers in mind, Despite being the smaller half of the French destroyer fleet, they were still substantial ships, at 1,800 tonnes standard and over 2,500 tonnes fully loaded. Their armament of a half dozen 130mm guns in three twin turrets made them more heavily armed than many fleet destroyers, and at 37 knots with seven torpedo tubes, their speed and anti-shipping capacity was also considerable. Although, again, issues with the guns and loading reduced their practical fighting capacity as compared to their paper stats. Japanese destroyer development from the immediate post-war Momi class to the Fubukis had been a relatively logical progression through the Minakaze, Wakatake, Kamikaze, 
and Mutsuki classes. Aside from the smaller Wakatakes, the rest had settled on a general armament of four single 120mm or 4 inch guns and six torpedo tubes, albeit with a change from three twin to two triple launchers as time went on. Displacement rose through a range of about 150 tonnes, up to about 1,300 tonnes standard load, and a top speed that varied but was around 37 knots, give or take a knot, until the coming of the Fabukis. The Fabuki subclasses improved on the dual purpose use of the main guns and introduced the innovative torpedo turret, which allowed for relatively safe reloading of torpedo tubes in action and also protected them against some incoming fire and splinters, a feature that would become somewhat more important with the oxygen fueled long lance that was later introduced in most Imperial Japanese surface ships that carried the heavy 24 inch torpedo launchers. However, a secondary clause to the London Naval Treaty meant that only a percentage of the three major powers destroyer fleets were allowed to reach the 1,850-ton displacement limit. The follow-on Hatsuharas were therefore ordered with the designers tasked with getting everything that a Fubuki had, but on 350 tons less displacement. As a 1500 ton limit had been agreed for general destroyer design for the bulk of the three and powers destroyer fleets. As it turned out, somewhat unsurprisingly, this wasn't possible, and the ships would have the three twin mounts reduced by one gun, leaving them with two twin mounts and a single. The Hatsuharas were a knot faster, but had only 80% of the range, and initially would retain the three triple torpedo turrets. But even these compromises weren't enough, and the ships proved to be very unstable and incredibly lightly built, and thus fragile. After storms damaged and sank a number of similarly lightly built Imperial Japanese warships, they needed rebuilding to strengthen them. This involved, amongst other things, relocating the single gun mount and removing the third torpedo turret, leaving the ship with two for a total of six torpedo tubes. These and other changes also resulted in the ship's speed dropping from just over 36 knots to around 34 knots. The second run of Hatsuharas were therefore reordered to a modified design as the Shiratsuyu class. Although technically still bound by the terms of the London Naval Treaty, the Japanese decided, as they would with many other classes of warship they, they were building at the time, to simply lie and complete the ships at almost 1,700 tons standard displacement. These ships would retain the Hatsuhara's modified 34 knot top speed and 5 gun main battery, but would upgrade the torpedo armament to a pair of quadruple torpedo turrets. Japan then decided to duck out of the naval treaty system entirely, and the Asashio class would see a rise in standard displacement to just under 2,000 tonnes, with a fully loaded displacement of nearly 2,400 tonnes. This would buy them another knot of top speed for 35 knots, a near doubling of operational range and the return of the six main gun battery in three twin mounts, along with the retention of the Shiratsuyu's pair of quadruple torpedo turrets. The class also saw the introduction of sonar to the Imperial Japanese destroyer fleet. The follow-on Kageros were broadly similar, using the same hull, but learning from the previous class, main and torpedo armament was the same, with slightly more beam added for stability. This pushed the overall displacement up slightly, and Japanese thinking would now diverge, with designs being produced for what was effectively a gigantic torpedo boat, another design for an upgraded general purpose fleet destroyer, and a third design for a dedicated fleet protection destroyer. But these designs would all be built during the World War II period, and so the Kageros are where we leave Imperial Japanese destroyer development for now. American destroyer development was on a rather different path, since whilst almost everyone else was either trying to replace war losses or modernise a fleet that was consisting mainly of older, smaller and obsolete vessels, the US Navy had so many Clemson and Wicks class destroyers that even the Honda Point disaster, where over half of Destroyer Squadron 11 managed to run aground in fog, was easily compensated for simply by reactivating additional reserve Clemsons. 
they indeed did not need to construct additional Clemsons. As a result, no new destroyers were built for the US Navy during the 1920s, outside of wrapping up the last of the Clemson contracts at the start of the period. Twelve years after the last Clemsons had been accepted into service, though, and things had changed. The Fabukis, and everybody else's responses to them, were now in service, and technological advances meant the vast swarm of Clemsons were beginning to show their age and approach block obsolescence. As one of the nations bound at this point by the limits of the London Naval Treaty, the new design could not be substantially larger than the Clemsons, Indeed, they couldn't actually even match the Fabukis. For a widespread class of fleet destroyers, they had to squeeze as much improvement as possible into a 150-ton displacement increase, to just over 1,300-ton standard displacement. Although in theory, they could have gone up to 1,500 tons, they chose for some reason to go for 1,300. However, whilst completing somewhat top-heavy, the resulting Farragut class showed significant promise, being able to reach 37 knots in top speed, again, assuming a flat calm, and despite their top-heavy nature, they were still somewhat more stable. Their main battery firepower was significantly increased, with five guns instead of four, an increase in calibre to five inches, and critically, all the guns were now mounted on the centerline, resulting in a five-gun broadside instead of three. The guns were also dual-purpose, and marked the introduction of the 5-inch 38 caliber gun to US destroyers. Although the shorter barrel meant a lower muzzle velocity compared to the older guns, these new weapons fired a far more destructive shell at a considerably faster rate, and were also fully dual-purpose weapons. Suddenly, modern US destroyer design shifted from the bottom of the pile in a surface action to near the top. Whilst torpedo armament dropped from 12 tubes to 8, all 8 were again mounted on the centerline in a pair of quad launchers, thus actually increasing the torpedo broadside by 2 whilst reducing the overall weight of the torpedo armament. The ship's main deck was also much higher than the Clemson's, meaning they took less water over the bows in moderate seas and could therefore keep up their speed in higher sea conditions compared to the older ships. They also managed to squeeze another 450 nautical miles of range out of improved machinery and extra fuel storage, with the Farraguts starting construction in 1933. The only real downside to this was that compared to the Clemson swarm, only eight of them were ordered, but there was more to come. However, before we cover that line of development, it's briefly worth mentioning that the US Navy did try to fill its allocation of 15% of total destroyer displacement, which could be built at up to 1,850 tonnes of displacement, with the US Navy having watched the Royal Navy's destroyer leader concept and other similar larger destroyer strains developing during the 1910s and 1920s, and so the immediate follow-on to the Farraguts were not, in fact, successors, but were the Porter class. Their general capabilities were broadly the same as the Farraguts, except for guns, with a heavier anti-aircraft battery, something largely ignored in this analysis on the dual grounds that interwar destroyer anti-aircraft batteries can almost universally be described as barely even suitable for self-defense outside of uh, ships with dual-purpose main battery guns, and even on the best of them, the total number and capability of the guns is still quite pitiful when compared with what the realities of war would force on them in fairly short order. Anyway, the other major change with the Porters was the main battery. With an extremely heavy armament of four twin 5-inch 38 caliber mounts for a total of eight guns, laid out like a heavy cruiser or battleship in two sets of super-firing mounts fore and aft. However, to save weight, these guns were placed in mounts that were limited to surface action only as built, leaving them to rely on secondary 1.1 inch and 50 caliber weapons for anti-aircraft defense, leaving the smaller Farraguts actually better protected in the anti-aircraft department, although the Porter's surface-to-surface -surface firepower was now considerable. It was not, however, quite king of the gunfighting ring, as the odd choice of using expressly dual-purpose 5-inch 38 caliber guns instead of a longer barrel gun, when you're going to restrict the gun to surface action only, 
would mean that a few other heavily armed destroyer designs of the period would possess superior main batteries when it came to surface-to-surface -surface action at range. A couple of years down the line, and the other flotilla leader type built by the US Navy started construction. The Summers class were based on the Porters, but where both Farraguts and Porters had used modern machinery to cut the number of funnels from four to two, the Summers were able to go a step further, from two funnels to one, with space given over to the primary other change from the Porters, a third quadruple torpedo launcher, which increased the torpedo broadside to 12, the largest single torpedo salvo of any US Navy destroyer. Like the Farraguts, both of these classes were somewhat top-heavy and proved difficult to upgrade later on as a result. Now, returning to the main line of destroyer development in the US Navy, classes began to appear thick and fast. 1934 would see the start of construction on the first of 18 Mahan or Mahan class destroyers. They improved on the Farragut class design with a new and more efficient set of machinery, which retained the same top speed and main gun battery on a slightly larger but treaty compliant 1,500 ton standard displacement. Torpedo armament was increased to 12 with the addition of another quad launcher, but since the ships were somewhat smaller than the Summers class would be, this would see a reversion to wing mounts with one quad launcher on the center line and the other two mounted on the wings on either side, resulting in the same eight torpedo maximum salvo, but with the ability, like the Clemsons, to wheel about and deliver a follow-up attack. The Mayhans also reduced the top heaviness of USN destroyer design, partially as a side effect of trying to clear away unnecessary superstructure to provide better fields of fire for anti-aircraft engagements. The next year came the Gridleys, which, like the Porters, saw improving machinery drop the number of funnels from two down to one. These varied with the pattern established by the previous two regular destroyer classes by sacrificing one of the main guns, reducing the main battery down to four, with the weight savings from the improved machinery and the loss of one of the guns going into yet another quad launcher for a total of 16 torpedo tubes, albeit by reverting to a Clemson-style arrangement with two launchers on each side, limiting the salvo to eight at a time. Some thought was given to using gyro settings to allow the ships to fire all 16 in a forward spread, but whilst a theoretical possibility, gyro set turns of any particular severity and angle were rather unpopular in naval circles due to torpedo's rather distressing habit of sometimes forgetting to stop turning and thus coming back around at the launching ships. This tor heavy torpedo battery was partially as a result of a decision that had been taken to no longer include torpedo tubes on US cruiser designs and to gradually remove them where possible from existing cruisers. This would reduce the overall torpedo strike power of the fleet compared with the Royal Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, which retained cruiser-based torpedoes, unless other ships happened to take up the burden. In the event, these changes undid some of the good work that had been done on the Mayhan class, and top heaviness returned to a degree in this particular variant. The changes and improved machinery brought the speed up by just over a knot to just over 38 knots, but also took displacement to nearly 100 tonnes over the treaty limits. Next up, and built at the same time, were the Bagley and Benham classes, which carried identical armaments to the Gridleys, but differed in machinery. The Bagleys using less powerful engines and being configured for longer-ranged operations, whilst the Benhams tried to combine the Gridleys' advanced high-pressure power plant with a range similar to the Bagleys, and as a result, both classes would tip in at just over 1,600 tonnes. Again, treaty-breaking, but by the mid-1930s, such a relatively minor violation was rather easily overlooked given some of the other shenanigans being got up to by navies across the world. 1937 saw the start of construction on the Sims class. By this point, the second London Naval Treaty had actually dropped destroyer displacement limits in favour of a general category of warships defined as having guns not exceeding 6.1 inches and not above 3,000 tonnes of displacement. However, the Sims class were not any greater in displacement than their predecessors, reverting to the Mayhans one centerline and two wing torpedo launchers, 
and reintroducing the fifth 5-inch gun, whilst retaining the new single funnel arrangement. Below decks, they kept the Benham's high-pressure long-range machinery, and perhaps most critically introduced the excellent Mark 37 fire control system, dramatically improving the lethality of the guns in the kind of swirling melee that destroyers would be expected to fight in. Unfortunately, issues with top heaviness and thus stability continued to plague the US destroyer designs, and the Sims class was coming in at about 10% overweight and thus dangerously unstable. This prompted first a rebuild, which dropped one of the quad torpedo launchers and moved the second torpedo launcher to the center line, which allowed them to retain an eight torpedo broadside, but without a secondary follow-up capability. It also meant losing the fifth gun, and prompted the start of a process that would eventually see the Bureau of Engineering and the Bureau of Construction and Repair merged into the Bureau of Ships within the next three years, since poor communication between the two departments was blamed for most of the problems. Without the treaty restrictions, 1938's project, the Bensons, would come in at 1,620 tonnes, saw the return of two funnels, and the fifth gun, again, this time without massive stability issues. Range improved by a thousand nautical miles to six and a half thousand nautical miles, and a new torpedo layout was introduced with a pair of quintuple centerline mounts for a total salvo of ten torpedoes. Machinery was also alternated to avoid the loss of all power to a single hull breach. In parallel, the Gleaves class was also under construction. Originally, these were simply more Bensons, the only real difference being some minor changes to machinery types and the fact that the Benson's funnels had flat sides and the Gleaves funnels were round. Due to their construction period overlapping the start of the Second World War, larger numbers would be ordered to bring up the size of the modern US Navy destroyer fleet. However, as with almost every US Navy 1930s destroyer design save the Mayhans, their stability as a result of top weight was not ideal. It wasn't as bad as many of the other classes, but about adequate is hardly a ringing endorsement, and the needs of war would see almost every destroyer class, including these ones, having to almost immediately lose either some primary gun weaponry or a torpedo launcher in order to upgrade the light and medium anti-aircraft batteries without compromising the ship's survivability, since remaining upright is generally seen as a good thing amongst most ships. The lessons learned, however, were taken on board for the next class of destroyer, which falls outside the scope of this examination of interwar designs, but which would prove to be even more numerous than the Clemson class. For that future ship would be the remarkable Fletcher class. And now, before a brief look at the Soviets and the Germans, we come to the Royal Navy. Whilst the Royal Navy also came out of World War I with large forces of modern destroyers, collectively generally put into the V and W classes, due to war losses and a few other issues, it didn't quite have the sheer numbers that the US Clemson Swarm presented. And it had its own rather unique design philosophies to experiment with. With budgets reduced in the 1920s, and the V and Ws, along with a couple of earlier classes, providing enough the strength for the moment, the early to mid-1920s in the Royal Navy were occupied mainly with playing around with the destroyer leader as a class, similar to larger destroyers built in other navies that had split their destroyer design lines. Compared to the V&W's four guns, which were variously four or 4.7 inch weapons depending on exactly which subclass you were looking at, and two triple torpedo launchers, there were the Shakespeare and Scott classes of destroyer leaders, whose construction had begun in the last days of the First World War, but was continued after the end of the conflict. These ships displaced four to 450 tonnes more than a standard V or W class, clocking in at around 1,500 tonnes standard, give or take 50 tonnes depending on the ship. This brought a significant increase in speed from between 32 to 34 knots to just over 36 knots in service and 38 knots on trials, along with considerably longer operational range. Both classes carried five single 4.7-inch guns and kept the two triple centerline torpedo launchers. 
but the cost of the ships and some dissatisfaction with their capabilities would see the Royal Navy drop the idea of entire classes of large flotilla leaders, reverting instead to the previous practice of ordering destroyers in flotillas, with each flotilla having a flotilla leader built for the class specifically, generally essentially as a stretched version of that particular class. With that particular line of development wrapped up, it would be another six years until, in the mid-1920s, the Royal Navy issued another call for destroyers. This resulted in two prototypes, HMS Ambushcade and HMS Amazon, built by the two great destroyer firms, Yarrow and Thornycroft, with the idea that these ships would form the basis of subsequent destroyer design. Both vessels retained the four single 4.7-inch guns of the later W-class, and the two triple torpedo tubes on the centerline, but were able to offer considerably greater speed for barely any increase in tonnage, mostly thanks to improvements in machinery, with both making over 37 knots on trial, compared to approximately 32 knots on their predecessors. Although, as with all destroyers from all nations, the practical in-service speed was lower than the trial speed. Using the lessons learned over a couple of years of operation with these ships and watching the debut of the Fabukis, the Royal Navy's first full post-war destroyer class was the A and B class, made up of two flotillas, one with all the names starting with A and the other with all the names starting with B, plus two additional ships for the Canadians. And of course a flotilla leader being built for each flotilla. Compared with the two prototypes, the A and B class carried about 150 tonnes more displacement for a standard displacement of 1,350 tonnes, and for this they achieved a significant range boost to 4,800 nautical miles, which was actually competitive with American destroyers, whilst accepting a drop in speed to 35 knots. The main battery remained four single 4.7-inch guns, but torpedo armament was improved from two triple to two quadruple launchers on the centerline. The two flotilla leaders were slightly different. HMS Codrington, the leader of A flotilla, was almost 200 tonnes heavier, which bore flotilla leader accommodations, almost three knots more speed, and a fifth gun, whilst HMS Keith, leader of B flotilla, was only about 100 tonnes heavier than the average B destroyer, and carried no extra weapons, as unlike Codrington, she used an identical hull to the regular, or private, ships, as they were called in the Royal Navy. It simply just had more superstructure. The latter approach was not seen as a great success, as it turned out there was something of a lack of space. The other major differences in the classes were that the A's carried minesweeping gear, whilst the B's carried sonar and depth charges. Lastly, HMS Acheron, of A Flotilla, was fitted with experimental high-pressure machinery a few years ahead of the US Navy and some other navies, but it was so plagued with biomechanical breakdowns that the Royal Navy decided to revert to lower-pressure machinery for the rest of the interwar destroyers, with higher-pressure machinery only showing up again in the middle of World War II, some ten years after the US Navy had managed to get the system working in their own designs in the early 1930s. The next design, starting construction in 1930, would be the C and D class. These were a few tons heavier, a knot faster, and had almost 6,000 nautical miles range. Otherwise, main battery and torpedo armament was as per the previous class, with flotilla leaders Kempenfelt and Duncan comprising a middle ground between Codrington and Keith. They used the same hull and layout as the regular private ships, but with smaller flotilla staff facilities. The class also introduced the 3-inch anti-aircraft gun to supplement the light AA armament, since the 4.7-inch weapon on the main battery was a surface-action-only weapon. The E and F class was ordered three years later, and once again displacement went up, now at just over 1,400 tonnes, although main and torpedo armament remained unchanged, with most of the displacement going into more fuel as the range crept up to a considerable 6,350 nautical miles at 15 knots. The main guns also increased their elevation to 40 degrees, which allowed a degree of theoretical anti-aircraft use to defend other ships, 
although this would be more by sheer volume of fire annoying hostile aircraft, since there was not actually any anti-aircraft fire control system installed. Going back to HMS Codrington's approach, the flotilla leaders, HMS Exmouth and HMS Faulkner, were about 80 tonnes heavier and lengthened to allow for considerably more superstructure and a fifth gun on both ships. The Royal Navy would tend to assign entire flotillas as built to certain stations and duties, so generally ships of the same starting letter would have similar operational careers, at least until wartime losses degraded the flotillas enough to force mergers. The next year, 1934, would see the GNH class, along with eventually the Havant class, which were a modified version built for Brazil and then brought back at the outbreak of war. These were slightly lighter than the preceding ships, with a similar displacement to the C and D class, and commensurately had a similarly reduced range, once again retaining the same 4-gun, 4.7-inch main armament and two quadruple launchers on the torpedo battery, with the exception of HMS Glowworm, which tested quintuple launchers, called Pentad launchers in the Royal Navy, instead of the quadruple ones. As with the E and F class, HMS Grenville and HMS Hardy, the flotilla leaders, would be longer variants with an additional gun and more superstructure, whilst HMS Herowood, one of the private ships, would test an experimental dual 4.7 inch mount. These were followed in 1937 by the I class, which were marginally heavier repeats of the G and H class, with the exception of adopting glowworms, quintuple or pentad launchers, increasing the torpedo broadside to 10. Machinery advances also saw them make 36 knots compared to the 35 of earlier classes, and HMS Inglefield, the flotilla leader, once again went with the extra main gun on a slightly longer hull. The I-Class also introduced the lightly armoured wedge-shaped bridge superstructure that would characterise Royal Navy destroyers from this point until the end of the Second World War. Whilst this quiet production of gradually incrementing destroyers in relatively large numbers was fine for most of the 1930s, two major factors now intervened. The Fabukis and their successors, plus the various large destroyers in US, French and Italian navies, plus now the German fleet, were beginning to cause a little bit of concern. The Royal Navy had plenty of destroyers, but small ships were so numerous in all navies that an edge in numerical superiority may not be as decisive as it would be in the realms of battleships and cruisers. The result was a major and radical shift in Royal Navy design. In 1938, this started with the construction of the Tribal class. At about 1,850 tonne standard displacement, they represented an almost 400 tonne jump in destroyer displacement in the Royal Navy. Torpedo armament plummeted to a single quad launcher, and speed remained unchanged at 36 knots, although with considerably more powerful engines due to the larger hull and displacement, which also served to increase the range a bit. So where, you ask, did all the weight go? It went into a massively increased battery of eight 4.7-inch guns in four twin mounts, double that of previous Royal Navy destroyers. They also had a dedicated anti-aircraft fire control system, although this was limited in usefulness by the continued 40-degree elevation limit on the guns, which again meant they could protect other ships, but not themselves with their main battery, something that will come back to haunt them later. Australia and Canada would also order tribal-class ships, and their power in surface engagements would see them sent into many of the hottest actions of the Second World War, although again, that's a story for another time. Due to their much larger size, the flotilla leaders, HMS Afridi and HMS Tata, were not any larger than the rest of the class. Although the Royal Navy and Commonwealth navies now had a ship arguably capable of winning a surface action with any other destroyer on the planet, at least as far as gunfights were concerned, this had been achieved at the cost of the smallest torpedo armament on a British destroyer since the start of the First World War, and they were very expensive ships. So the next class built, the JKNN class, would change things up again. 
this class retained a powerful main battery, but this was reduced to six guns in three twin mounts. Lessons learned from the tribals saw new machinery layouts, bow forms and structural elements, allowing the ships to drop about 150 tons of displacement, which was considerably more than just losing one turret. And in exchange, they regained the second torpedo mount and the return of the quintuple or pentad launcher, restoring the 10 torpedo broadside in addition to the heavier gun armament. The only downside was the main battery was still limited to 40 degrees elevation upon completion. Once again, flotilla leaders HMS Jervis, Kelly and Napier did not substantially differ from their fellow destroyers. The last class of pre-war Royal Navy Fleet destroyers would be the L and M class. At 1,920 tons, they displaced even more than the tribals. The gun armament, however, remained six 4.7-inch guns in three twin mounts, but these were now fully enclosed, gained an additional 10 degrees of elevation to 50 degrees, and a more lethal, heavier shell. Although still not as good as the twin 5-inch 38 mount in the anti-aircraft department, the new mount was reasonably capable, especially when compared to almost any Axis destroyer. Torpedo armament dropped back to 8 torpedoes in two quad launchers, and in the event construction during wartime would lead to a number of these ships completing with four twin 4-inch mounts instead. This slightly lessened their anti-surface firepower, but dramatically improved their anti-aircraft firepower, as these smaller twin mounts were capable both of firing much faster and also capable of tracking and elevating much more rapidly. In surface actions, their individual lack of lethality was somewhat compensated for by the rather worrying level of firepower they could sustain, theoretically, on a good day, capable of pumping 160 rounds a minute in the direction of whichever unfortunate soul was at the other end of the target sites. All subsequent fleet destroyers of the Royal Navy would be wartime builds, and thus out of the scope of this video. However, the last destroyer class of any sort that bears mentioning at this point is the Hunt class. These were part of the Royal Navy's program of escort building in 1939 that also gave us the Flower class, the Hunts being larger escort destroyers, and thus not intended for fleet work. They reverted to a much smaller 1,000 ton displacement and a lower top speed of just over 27 knots, which was more than enough for convoy escort and anti-submarine work. A much shorter range of 3,500 nautical miles was also accepted, as they would be operating mainly in coastal areas or near ports, or else on somewhat of the more direct convoy routes. As designed, they were supposed to carry three twin 4-inch mounts, a few AA guns, and plenty of depth charges and their launchers. No torpedoes were deemed necessary since their targets would be submarines and aircraft. Unfortunately, the first ships were badly overweight and had to drop one of the twin mounts. The next wave corrected this and retained all six guns, followed by another batch destined for the Mediterranean, where encounters with Italian surface vessels were considered far more likely, and so a pair of torpedo tubes were fitted at the cost of one of the gun mounts, taking guns back down to four. Two of the last Hunt class, which were classified as Type 4 Hunt class, were somewhat different ships, built by Thornacroft, and as a result, at almost 200 tonnes heavier, carried a significantly heavier armament that included all six main guns, three torpedo tubes, and a boosted anti-aircraft armament. That brings us to an end of destroyer development amongst the major navies of the world, with continuity in design across the interwar period. Now, Germany was left with almost a joke of a navy by the Versailles Treaty, and so their destroyer development, somewhat unsurprisingly, came to a screaming halt. However, the Germans had developed the torpedo boat concept as an ancillary to larger destroyers during World War I, and these small craft would continue development post-war, as they were allowed to build ships of this type up to an 800-ton displacement limit. Annoyingly, Germans would label most of their craft as the insert year here type, but this reflected the start of the design period rather than the actual build or commission dates early on, so the first two classes developed in the 1920s, the Type 1923 and Type 1924 torpedo boats, 
didn't actually start construction until 1925 and 1927 respectively, with the bulk of the classes coming into service about two years after the hull was begun. The Type 1923 worked off the last high seas fleet designs and was generally slightly larger for better sea keeping, but otherwise similar in specification, with an average, if technically slightly treaty breaking, 850 ton standard displacement, giving them a ship capable of between 32 to 34 knots in a calm sea and a rather pedestrian main battery of three single 105mm guns alongside a pair of triple torpedo launchers. Range was extremely limited at only 1,800 nautical miles. Overall, they were actually approaching the size and displacement of some of the smaller legacy destroyers present in some of the other navies, but were significantly less capable. The follow-on Type 1924 s were supposed to be generally similar, but with 127mm or 5-inch guns, somewhat ambitious on a ship that was still over just only just over 900 tons standard displacement but would in general actually receive improved 105 mm guns notably these ships also used the slightly smaller 500 mm or 19.7 inch torpedoes as opposed to the standard 21 inch and heavy 24 inch torpedoes that were used by most other navies the effects of the Great Depression hit Germany extremely hard, and so it should be little surprise that the late 1920s and early 1930s were somewhat lacking in destroyer development. Torpedo boat development only picking up again in the late 1930s with the Type 1935 torpedo boat, which helpfully began construction in 1938. This vessel was actually smaller than its predecessors. At just over 850 tons standard displacement, it was, nonetheless, slightly faster at 35 knots, but carried effectively nothing in the way of main armament, being equipped with a single 105mm gun and a few anti-aircraft guns. It retained the two triple torpedo tubes, now using the more standard 21-inch torpedo, and could also carry quite a few mines. These were accompanied in the same year, as by the related Type 1937s, which were generally similar, but had slightly more range and sea keeping in exchange for a few dozen tons more displacement. Both classes featured new high-pressure boilers, which proved somewhat temperamental, to say the least, but with their lack of any real gun armament, they were perhaps the truest throwback to the four-decade-old torpedo boat concept, and would still see service in the Second World War. The next class, the Type 1939 or Elbing class, would follow the inevitable design trend of most destroyer types and actually be competitive with many smaller and older destroyers, despite theoretically being a torpedo boat. But as their construction started in 1940, they will be in the next video on this subject. Complicated high-pressure machinery with a tendency to spontaneously disassemble itself unless the machine spirits were properly appeased would also feature frequently in the main line of German fleet destroyer development. The development of these ships would kick off in the mid-1930s, with the primary expected opponent at the time being France, which of course had gone down the route of very large destroyers or small light cruisers with a very poor disguise. As such, the Type 1934 destroyer, which thankfully actually started construction in 1934, immediately clocked in at just over 2,200 tons standard displacement and over 3,100 tons fully loaded, only slightly less than contemporary French vessels. Somewhat unsurprisingly, for a design that was both a bit of a rush job and the first fleet destroyer that Germany had built in almost two decades, they had several flaws aside from the engines. Their sea keeping was poor thanks to a knife style bow that let a lot of water over the forecastle at high speeds or in moderate seas, and their range was relatively poor as well at under 2,000 nautical miles as a result of having to retain about a third of their fuel as ballast after some stability issues showed up in service to the extent of use all your fuel and there's a very good chance you're returning to port upside down. However, they could reach 36 knots, and their primary armament of five single 127mm or 5-inch guns would put them in the upper bracket of gun-based destroyers. A respectable two quad torpedo launchers maintained a decent anti-capital ship capacity, 
and their anti-aircraft armament was also unusually heavy for a pre-war destroyer design, with four 37mm cannons in a pair of twin mounts and six single 20mm cannons. The next year would see the Type 1934As begin construction. These were generally similar, with almost all changes aimed around improving stability and seakeeping. In this regard, the efforts were only partially successful, owing to several measures contradicting each other. An improved bow shape was offset by modifications to the stern, which were designed to improve the turning radius and raise the stern deck somewhat higher than water surface level, but also had the effect of forcing the bow lower again, which negated much of the benefit from the improved bow shape. These counteracting lifting forces also then exerted significant rotational force on the ship's hull amidships, which would in turn then require further reinforcement as cracks began to develop in service. One ship, the Z8 Bruno Heinemann, would also test the 150mm or 5.9 inch guns that were intended for later German destroyer classes. Given the chance for a clean slate design to address the issues surrounding the previous two classes, German designers would next submit the Type 1936, which, again, was helpfully actually built in 1936. They increased standard displacement to just over 2,400 tonnes, with full load being about 1,000 tonnes above that. Whilst the temperamental machinery was still present, range also increased a bit, creeping over 2,000 nautical miles for the first time, and the armament was also left alone. Most of the changes made compared to their predecessors were again in the hull, cutting down on top weight and radically changing the shape of the bow, as well as widening the beam slightly. These changes in design finally gave the Germans a destroyer that wasn't either trying to tear itself apart simply by moving, or immediately trying to join the U-boat corps at the first sign of a wave, and so could be considered to be the first generally successful German interwar fleet destroyer design. Of course, having finally made something that worked, they had to go and ruin it. They did this with the Type 1936A, or Narvik class, which would start construction in 1938 and 1939. Displacement went up again to around 2,600 tonnes standard and nearly 3,700 tonnes fully loaded. Speed remained at around 36 knots, whilst range increased to about 2,600 nautical miles and anti-aircraft batteries and torpedo batteries were initially the same as previous. So, where's the flaw, you ask? Well, they decided to arm these ships with the 150mm or 5.9 inch guns they'd tested earlier, with the aim to mount two in a twin turret forward, with three single guns amidships and aft. In the event, the twin turret wasn't actually ready in time, and the first ships would generally complete with a single gun forward instead. Unfortunately, whilst the twin turret, when present, had a limited dual purpose use that thanks to a 65 degree elevation, this heavy armament undid most of the work they'd previously put into improving stability and sea keeping, with the bow twin turret especially when installed making the ships very wet, helped only slightly by the fact that at least the turret was fully enclosed so everybody else got damp socks instead of the turret crew. This feature rather unsurprisingly limited their speed in any kind of significant sea state, and made them somewhat less than ideal gun platforms, and their rate of fire was also somewhat lacking thanks to the rather large shells needed. Albeit that the gun as a whole weapon system didn't have quite as many issues apart from weight of shell as compared to French super destroyer guns. So the rate of fire was still at least better than that. The next class of destroyers planned was cancelled by the outbreak of World War II, and a modified version of the Narviks would be the first German ships built during the Second World War. It bears mentioning at this point that as gun sizes crept up in destroyers across various navies, one often unmentioned point is how the guns were aimed. At the start of the interwar period, this was often done by hand, with minor assistance from various mechanisms. During this period, powered training and elevation mechanisms were introduced, which allowed the gun to be turned and the barrel raised, respectively, with significantly less effort needed from the crew, and in most cases significantly faster movement, which would improve combat capability. 
The two systems had different rates of development, and a number of classes of destroyer would have one but not the other. With one final aspect developed being power assisted loading. Full introduction of these three systems was first seen commonly in the US Navy, with the French and German navies notably being somewhat behind in this regard, despite their use of the largest guns for destroyers of the period. The Soviet Navy is the last that we will cover, and like the Germans, had to start fleet destroyer design in the 1930s, albeit thanks to the country catching a bad case of communism and the associated civil war symptoms, and so they hadn't built much of anything in the 1920s, not even torpedo boats. Much like the Germans, the Russians were quite impressed with the on-paper abilities of the French contre torpilleurs their large destroyers, and likewise sought to match them with the Leningrad class. These ships had a much narrower loading margin, at just over 2,300 tonnes standard, there was only about a 300 tonne difference between that and full load. As with the German ships, their range was limited, albeit slightly greater than the Type 1934s turned out, with the Leningrads capable of travelling 2,100 nautical miles. On such large ships, their on paper stats were impressive, 40 knots, along with five single 130mm or 5.1 inch main guns, a pair of quad torpedo launchers and numerous mines and depth charges, as well as quite a decent for the time anti-aircraft battery. The idea was something of a hybrid. They weren't supposed to be a type on their own, like the French ships, they were actually supposed to be flotilla leaders, but unlike the British approach of slightly larger variants of the flotilla class itself, this approach was somewhat similar to the US Navy's, with the class being designed to be split across numerous lesser flotillas as leaders, albeit that the Leningrads were infinitely superior to the somewhat geriatric collection of Tsarist-era destroyers that they were nominally in charge of. Given that they were trying to go from 0 to 100 even faster and more radically than the Germans, it's perhaps unsurprising that these ships came with a laundry list of issues. Starting with the fact that the Soviet shipyards had never actually built a destroyer, let alone one of this size, and so they had a somewhat optimistic view of their ability to actually construct them. So they combined some of the worst flaws that were found in everybody else's designs. They had stability issues due to being extremely top-heavy, they were badly weighted, so the bow was always trying to head down to meet nearby submarines, and the whole structure couldn't withstand the firing of the main battery. Oh, and they'd also start to provide free massages to the crew in the form of whole hull vibrations when they tried to get up to top speed. The fun didn't end there, with the main battery made up of five single 130mm or 5.1 inch guns, and they were given extremely powerful charges for their shells to try and replicate the ballistic performance of earlier, even longer guns. And as a result, the guns would wear out very quickly, had an absolutely vicious recoil, and as a result, also pretty terrible accuracy. Fixing even some of these problems took so long that the guns only began to arrive four years after the construction of the ships themselves had started in 1932. On the plus side, the torpedo battery of two quad launchers presented comparatively few issues, and at least in trials, the ships were able to exceed even the ambitious design speed of 40 knots, reaching a high point of 43 knots, albeit at the cost of having converted a warship into the world's fastest and most expensive group therapy massage chair. Oh, and of course, there were production issues with the turbines, which meant that the hulls were actually pretty much complete before either the propulsion or the main armament were delivered both of which are rather important components to a warship. It should therefore not come as any kind of shock that when it came to the next class of destroyers, the Soviets went looking for help. They'd end up turning to the Italians. This would also bring about two lines of design, the main development path for Soviet destroyers henceforth, and a couple of single experimental ships, which we'll have a look at a little bit later. The next class, the Gunveni, or Gremiashi class, also known as Project 7, was started in 1935, a year before the guns for the Leningrads would actually show up. Compared to their massive predecessors, they were much less ambitious, at 1,600 tonnes standard and just over 2,000 tonnes fully loaded. Indeed, they took an existing Italian design, the Folgores, and modified it. 
Unfortunately for them, the Italian ships were only just on the acceptable side of stable, and the modifications would add weight in places it really wasn't needed when your primary interests include not swimming in the Arctic Ocean. Design speed dropped to only 37 knots, although many would prove faster on trials, and the main battery was reduced by one gun to four single 130mm guns. The torpedo battery likewise dropped from two quad launchers to two triple launchers. As they were using the same guns as the Leningrads, they had broadly the same issues, with rate of fire on the guns dropping considerably from the initial aims to something more along the lines of the rate of fire of a light cruiser rather than a destroyer. Range was also relatively short, but not terrible, at 2,600 nautical miles, albeit that this distance could be travelled at a somewhat higher than average cruising speed compared to most other destroyers. 1936 saw the start of work on the Storozhevoys, which, as Project 7U, were generally repeats in terms of armament, with most of the work going into fixing the issues in the previous run of destroyers. This meant a stronger hull, more redundant machinery, and rearranging the layout of the anti-aircraft battery, that all saw displacement creep up to just over 1,700 tonnes standard, and just under 2,300 tonnes fully loaded, but also saw top speed tip back over 40 knots again, which was nice. The problems with seaworthiness and stability that were experienced with all of these classes which was especially a problem when water coming over the bow wasn't just annoying, but a genuine and immediate threat to life when you were in the freezing cold that characterised much of the Soviet Navy's operational area, all led to the Project 30, or Ognevoy class, which started construction in 1938. The hull was much enlarged at just over 2,100 tonnes standard and over 2,800 tonnes fully loaded, which helped with stability as total armament didn't increase. But the guns were now fitted in a pair of twin turrets instead of four open mounts, somewhat in the Italian style. The extra mass of the turrets plus an even stronger hull and more height to the main deck level saw speed drop back to just over 36 knots, with the Project 30K variant coming in slightly heavier as a result of increased anti-aircraft armament and other small changes that came about as a result of wartime experience, since many of the class were still under construction at the time of the German invasion and thus would not be completed until after the end of the Second World War. The next class, the Kievs, started construction just after the outbreak of World War II, and so will be looked at in the next video on the subject. The other two destroyers mentioned earlier were the 1935 Opitini, I think, which was built as a testbed to compare Soviet ideas with the Italian-guided Project 7s. Predictably, after the Leningrads, a pure Soviet-designed destroyer was a bit of a disaster, with added German high-pressure machinery to help along with the shenanigans. The 1,700 tonnes of standard displacement was supposed to carry three twin turrets using that questionable 130mm gun, plus two quadruple torpedo tubes and, new, and the new engines. What they got was a ship with almost no range at about 1,400 nautical miles, a speed of only 35 knots, and so many problems with stability and turret weight that the ship ended up with three single guns instead, which left it very poorly armed for a ship of this size. Italian help was quite sensibly enlisted for the other ship, the destroyer leader Tashkent, which came in at an eye-watering 2,800 tonnes standard and 4,100 tonnes displacement when absolutely everything was aboard. Packing in over a third again more engine power than you'd find in a town-class cruiser, the ship was designed to top 42 knots, sail for over 5,000 nautical miles, and carry three twin 130mm turrets, nine torpedo tubes in three triple launchers, as well as many mines and depth charges. It was intended to build this design as a class, but issues with Soviet shipyards meant that only Tashkent would be built, and she would be built in Italy. Problems with putting the 130mm in a twin turret in the late 1930s meant that she would initially complete with three singles instead, although she would eventually get the designed main guns. 
However, apart from the construction issues themselves, she was also too big and expensive to ever form a justifiable line of destroyers, even destroyer leaders, given that they were coming in to the same weight and size or category as a number of contemporary light cruisers, but with nowhere near the combat power. And that brings us to the end of the interwar destroyer period for the main navies that would go on to fight in World War II. The main highlights, really, being that almost everyone ended up trying to do far too much on too small a hull and ending up having stability problems as a result, with a number of European navies also ending up building hulls far too light and guns far too large for effective use, with a special shout out to the Germans for innovations in the field of self-consuming machinery and ships that truly believed that they identified as pretzels. With all that said, the race started by the Fabukis back in the mid-1920s would eventually result in a number of excellent designs once all the lessons had been learned. It was just something of a shame that most of the classes that fully realised the various nations' design visions only started construction at the end of the 1930s, just as the Second World War broke out, the conditions of which would leave many navies unable to complete their ambitions either through reprioritization of resources or the minor fact that they'd been occupied. With all that said, most of these ships and their soon-to-be successors would now be thrown into the crucible of war, an environment where the fact that you could float, move and shoot was all that was important. Issues like uh, stability and rate of fire tended to take something of a backseat to simply being available, and on paper statistics became practically irrelevant. All that and more to come in a few months when we'll wrap up this line of videos with destroyer development during the Second World War, which is pretty much the apotheosis of destroyer development as a concept that starts back when Queen Victoria was still in charge. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.